Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to our second budget town hall meeting. Um, yesterday, we had one that focused on police and fire, so our public safety. And today, we're here to talk about parks, streets, and Department of Public Works. Um, some of you were here yesterday, so thanks for returning, and thanks to our new guest here. We are happy that um, you have joined us and that you're taking the interest in our city. It is nice um, always when our citizens get involved. Tonight will be casual, just like last night. We'll go through a um, presentation of a department, and then we will open it up for questions. We will bring the mic to you to um, ask your questions. Because the meeting is being recorded, we want to make sure that those who watch it later are able to hear your questions. Um, unfortunately, the mayor was not able to join us this evening, and so he did ask me to welcome everyone. But he had a previous commitment, and so we're happy to be here and share. You're really going to hear from the experts um, in each department tonight, just like you did yesterday. And so I think you're going to find it to be another informative evening with great information. There's lots happening in the city of Lawrence. Last night, if you listened or were here for the public safety, you'll know that Fire Station 38 is going to be opening soon. So we are waiting to those things are finalized, a few things finalized or finished, completed, before we actually share that ribbon cutting date with you. But watch social media and be part of the fun and the growing City of Lawrence. For those of you who do not know, um, this Saturday, make sure that you join us at the library opening. Uh, the ribbon cutting starts at 10 a.m., so we're excited. What I think the mayor said that was 30 years in the happening, and so we look forward to being there. Yes, they do have some music outside starting at 9.30, and then the doors open at 10 o'clock. So thank you, Pat. Let's see. Um, Tyler, I think we're going to turn it over you to get started. I know yesterday the mayor did share some different things about our OR operating reserve, those kinds of things. But I think you can speak to a lot of those things best, along with some of the other information you'd like to share. Yes, thank you. So, so we pretty much had the same group. And so the first half of this, pre actually the first, really the majority of it is basically the exact same thing as we discussed yesterday. So uh, I, won't, I won't put everyone to sleep. I'll be kind of quick on uh, some of those. So um, let's kind of turn it over to the agenda here. So again, some of the things we covered yesterday, the revenue sources, a 23 budget review. We'll talk about the operating reserves covered our property taxes and that includes a property tax estimate and then because we're talking about streets and parks today um, streets has a unique revenue sources so I'm going to talk about those revenue sources separately um, so most of you actually probably are going to be only interested when I get to that piece that's the only thing new from from yesterday but um, some people here in the audience missed the first half so I'll be kind of brief um, so everyone's kind of up to speed uh, so first, we're going to kick it off here with our revenue sources. So this just gives you a nice breakdown of our general fund, which is our main operating fund here in the city. Uh, we are estimating that the 2024 revenue sources, uh, our inflows, will be about $28 million. And so that will make up uh, what's coming in to help fund our 2024 budget proposal. The largest percentage there is that 42% you see is our property taxes. So we're going to get into the property taxes and how that's um, calculated and kind of what we can do uh, there and what's in con in our control and what's not. Uh, the next largest piece is our local income taxes. So that bundles in the LIT, which is local income tax, and the COIT, which is a county option income tax. So that's about 19% uh, of the total general fund revenue sources. And the next largest piece you see up there is the services and charges, which are basically taxes. It's uh, our payment in lieu of taxes. So that's negotiated uh, payments from entities that do not pay taxes but do receive city services like public safety. So we do some negotiating to make sure we get some good 
uh, yeah, get some get some money in here for the city, and so that makes up 16%, yeah, 16 of our general fund uh, revenues. So those are the three primary sources of revenue, and we're going to speak on, on the property taxes piece towards the end a little bit. Uh, but kind of getting the picture of what's coming in the city, how does that then get allocated? Again, this is a review from last night. Just our 2023 budget is a good uh, way to look at things because we don't anticipate much of a percentage breakdown change for the 24 proposal, but 77.7% is public safety. We're talking about parks today. Parks makes up six, almost six and a half percent of our general fund. Uh, and then you have in there, next up, we'll talk a little bit too about DPW, um, which is permitting and code enforcement. And that is 3.7%, almost 4%, Shree. So he's, uh, he's in there as well. Um, so that's kind of how once the money comes in, this is where it gets split up. Again, you know, public safety is a large percentage given the size of the departments. And I don't think we covered what all's in there, but it's police, fire, and communications. So when you see that percentage breakdown, it's three departments, and really it's the three largest departments in the city. And we spoke on the operating reserves, so I'll, I'll pull up a chart here on those. And, and we talked a little about the, the importance of these um, operating reserves. So this is just in our general fund specifically. Um, so the main importance of operating reserve is so that you have enough uh, cash on hand to start the year um, so that you can cover your bills before your first tax distribution. So that, that allows you to not need to take out a TAN or a tax anticipation note, so it'll save taxpayers interest uh, not needing those short-term loans. And so that's been helpful, especially with the rising interest rate environment that we're seeing now. So our 24 budget proposal will be a proposal that we maintain those operating reserves. So it's a target of ours. It's one that the mayor's wanted, and um, even the previous controller advocated for it. It's a good target to have. Um, and so we're looking forward to maintaining that one for, I think, our sixth consecutive year. Very proud of that. And that's the importance of those reserves. Now, again, very similar to last night, so we're going to go over property taxes, how it works. These are the two key terms to know, your NAV, your net assessed value. Um, so Councilor Freeman's here. She understands this better than anybody. Your assessor's office um, is what goes out and assesses all the values. So for us, if we talk about the city's NAV, it's our tax base. It's what is the net assessed value of all the properties in the city, and that's your base value. Then when you issue a levy, it's what you want to collect from basically that tax base. Um, so for us, both of these aren't within our control. Again, the assessor's office does the valuations, um, and then you obviously do your deductions. That gives us our net. The levy is dictated by the state. So right now, um, the, the state locked that in at a 4% growth for the next three years. So we're limited uh, on our general fund levy. Uh, growth. Uh, but if they didn't do that, they have a calculation method they use each year, but again, that's, that's set by the state. So actually, there's a little tweak to this slide that makes it easier to read. So it's a little bit of a lot here, so we're going to go through 2024 property tax estimates. Um, so first, we'll kind of look at the 23 column here. So what you see is some of these things that we just discussed. So the levy is 14 million. That's all the different, the four major funds that have a levy. You have your net assessed value, which went up 18% from last, from 22, which is a $2 billion net assessed value. And so that resulted in a property tax reduction. So we went from 73 cents down to 67 cents. So significant property tax reductions. So there's a better chart on the next slide to show kind of you can see the, how the relationship between our assessed value and our tax rate works, but as the assessed value grows, more than what our levy can grow, our tax rate is going to decline. And that's just kind of the relationship there. So for 2024, we kind of have it equalizing here. So it's a slight increase from 67 cents back up to 70 cents, still down from really all the way back in 2019. Um, we did see what I was expecting to be a little bit more growth, <laughs> and Councillor Freeman and I have discussed this, I was hoping for probably six or seven percent assessed value growth, but uh, the county has certified 4.7, call 4.8 percent growth on our net assessed values. Um, and then we have some of our um, debt levies that have kicked in, but overall still a relatively low rate compared to other municipalities. Now this is one thing I didn't know at last night's meeting, this is just the city of Lawrence tax rate. So if you pull your property tax bill at the 
with the county, you'll see the county's levy, the um, schools, library. So there's more things that make up our total property tax rate for a citizen in Lawrence than just the city of Lawrence rate. Uh, but this is what's kind of within our control. So this is a little bit easier to read. Um, as you can see, that's the blue line is our assessed value growth. So as that has been growing, you can kind of see our tax rate has done a little bit of fluctuation, but it's kind of slowly worked its way down. And so that's just the, the way that the property tax works here in the, city, in the state of Indiana. Um, so yeah, we've had some significant growth um, over the last few years, really 1.4 billion back in 19 up to 2.1 here in 2024. So, you know, that's not just, I mean, we've done a lot here in Lawrence to help increase the values from um, bringing in new businesses, but it's also the recent spike in um, own values we've seen. So that, that explains the 18% growth, which was really unusual uh, back in 2020, or actually for this year, not back in. So, so that's kind of a quick revenue update. That's nothing new for anybody who's here last night. Um, what I do want to do now, though, is is pass it on to Parks. Nope, um, I'm going to catch you, and I have a few questions, questions. for you. Yeah. Um, we have received award from the DLGF. Talk a little... D GFOA? Is that what you're oh, about? sorry, the GFOA. Excuse me. The Government Finance Op Officers Association, is it? Okay, so from the GFOA, we've received that for seven years now. Can you talk a little bit about what that award is for? Yeah, so that is a budget award. The GFOA is the Government Finance Officers Association. It's a pretty major um, national association that oversees and provides a lot of guidance in relations to how you should operate as a fiscal officer. And so the, the GFOA because of name wrong, award for budget transparency is the highest ranking award they give out for budgets. So it's, it's about being transparent. It's also about setting key indicators so you can get performance indicators on how your city's doing. It's really about how, what are you sharing with the community. It's making you do your due diligence on your capital improvement plans. It's really making sure that you as a city are being open to the public, but also internally working uh, to be strategic and making sure you're doing a lot of planning. Um, so it's a great, it's a great thing. It has a lot of great criteria. And make sure you're hitting a lot of things, and really, you know, it's a great thing to give the public, but it helps internally as well to make sure that we're uh, planning. And so, you know, if you're here for last night's meeting, you, you heard about um, fire engines that are two years out, uh, ambulances that are now 12 months to be delivered. So if we can plan appropriately, that helps. So we've done a lot more planning in the last 12 months than we had to even have to do, probably. 48 months ago. I mean, it's because of some of these delays and the supply chain stuff, because of the things we had in place by doing these, um, by hitting these criteria, it helped us be prepared for um, really unforeseeable for circumstances. So, yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Okay, before we go on and before we introduce our first department head, um, anybody have any questions for Tyler? Tyler, my question is this. Uh, property values uh, on residences have gone up the last couple of years. I know there's circuit breakers and caps. Uh, our fabulous legislature uh, has said that this coming session, they are going to look in the complaints they got with the increased uh, property values, property taxes going up. What could they do that could harm our collection or the amount of monies that we get to run our city from property taxes? I could do a couple of things. Uh, so that's a good question. Overall, uh, the first thing that they did do, and, and that's already in place, is they've limited the levy growth. So last year, for, for 2023, we, we had a 5% levy growth, and the state has now capped what we can increase our general fund levy for 4% for the next three years. So that's one area where, had they left the calculation go, it, maybe it would have been five, five or six percent. So they've limited how much we can grow um, our general fund levy. And so for us, the general fund is our primary operating fund. So if that's limited, it, it hurts us. Um, I'll be interested to see what else they do. Yeah, they may implement maybe some new circuit breakers and, and make the county's life a little bit more difficult. But um, yeah, if they, if they maybe they if they institute any new deductions, anything that they could do to reduce our net assessed value would also then. I mean, 
yeah, if they reduced your net assessed value, that would be another way that that would kind of hurt us because then you can you can hit the circuit breakers a lot faster. So that then hurts us. Our levy wouldn't change, but then the base would reduce. So yeah, there's a couple things, and, it, and it's difficult because for us, once that's gone, it's gone. It's really hard to to recap that. So. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jeff Fest is our Parks Board President and also the President of the Fort Harrison Reuse Authority. Hi, Pat Burton. I've got more questions than I had last night. What's a circuit breaker? So the circuit breaker, so we kind of talk about it broadly as a circuit breaker loss, but that's um, how much property taxes in the, in the state will calculate that once they've certified the budget, they will certify how much you've lost because the circuit breakers are in, a pl in place. And that's if you have, um, you can only pay up to was it, one, two, and three percent, depending on which category you're in. And there's different homestead exemptions. So they'll calculate how much property tax you're losing because of um, what the state has put in place. Yeah. So you'll hear more about those as the county certif or the state certifies the budget. A lot of people don't know that there's a disabled exemption for low-income people. Yeah, I guess a lot of people don't know that. I didn't meet it. I made too much money. <laughs> so a lot of the information, I actually got a call actually today um, from a resident looking for um, property tax-related information. So this is a good plug for the county. If you have any property tax-related questions, um, deductions, tax abatements, any questions like that, Call the auditor, not the assessor. Call the county auditor, uh, and they have, or go to ndgov, ND.gov. There you go. Next question. I've owned three businesses in Lawrence over the last 40 years. I never came to the city to try to get any in uh, incentive money. How does that process work when somebody says, I'd consider moving my business to you, but can you give me some breaks on taxes or other things? So how is it initiated? That's a good question. That's actually, um, Jeff, you're working on that right now when we do that. That's actually done through the county, and it is not done through the city of Lawrence. The city of Lawrence does, um, there's paperwork they fill out through Marion County for a tax abatement or something like that. It um, goes through their um, council as well as going through our council. I'll give you the first step. Real okay, quick. so Jeff's going to take it from here because he's working on one now. Because of UNIGOV, outdated as it is, uh, Lawrence is limited uh, for incentives to business. The first step you have to, there's an application fee. It's in the range of $5,000. And it's underwritten. You work through uh, the chamber, and then an arm of the chamber is Develop Indy. And then through Develop Indy, you will work with Metropolitan Development Commission. I'm going downtown tomorrow for a hearing. But that's kind of the initial steps. And then it comes out to if you get through those steps, the Lawrence Council would then in turn, they can vote yes or they can vote no uh, on the, that they get the final say. But the process has to uh, uh, work through downtown Indianapolis. Uh, no, that it does not. It goes through the MDC, the Metropolitan Development Commission. Yes. And that's the reason is Lawrence is still part of the MDC. We don't have our own kind of commission. So everything is going to the Metropolitan Commission of uh, Marion County, which is downtown. That's what. That's what. <laughs> you need that because we're recording and people need to be able to hear you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, here I come. Was it in a past budget year that the ARP funds showed up, and what's the potential for their availability this year or next? Is there a goal on what line item is going to be dedicated to? So there's two. There's kind of a two-step process for ARP funds. You have to have an ARP plan approved by the fiscal body, and then the, the funds do need to be appropriated. Um, so... The goal you have basically you only need we found out recently from the state board of accounts and so this is new kind of information on the ARP funds is they only need to be appropriated once. Only a portion of those funds have been appropriated so far. 
Um, the plan, I believe, with the 24 budget will just be to appropriate the rest of them. That'll be according to the existing plan. Um, I couldn't speak really on to what would be available this year. It's still kind of in the works. Good question. All right, and I do want to point out we do have two of our um, common council members here, Sharon Freeman, and you, um, Sharon, if you could raise your hand. And so um, you'll see uh, once in a while Tyler was looking towards her because she does work at the assessor's office. And so um, she, uh, they have lots of good conversations about what's happening there. And then we also have Deb Whitfield. So thank you both for joining us today. All right. That briefly concludes my financial revenue side of things. We're going to pass it on to Parks to talk about their 23 accomplishments, some ongoing things, 24's objectives, and I'll kick back in. 23, 24, just keep rolling. Um, I am going to reference something that Tyler said. Um, as City of Lawrence residents, we pay an Indy Park tax, so roughly the residents of Lawrence pay roughly about a half a million dollars annually to the Indy Park system. Um, in turn, we have one park location that Indy Parks owns in the city of Lawrence. Uh, so if we think back for the 40, 50 years that we've done this UNIGOV, the citizens of Lawrence have funded a lot of Indy Park programs through the Indy Park tax. Uh, all of our funds for our department are issued through the general fund, so we're in competition with the fire department, police department, everyone else. So just a, just a caveat there that we do not receive any of the Indy Parks funds. Uh, well, I take that back. We did in 1990. We received $350,000 to help build and uh, the uh, Lawrence Community Center. So... Um, just a just a caveat there to, to remember. Um, I'm not the most technical savvy, but I'll I'll go through some of these. We have an overhead of the, uh, and I'm not sure if Tyler can bring it up for me or not. Um, one of our accomplishments in 2023 has been the um, design and uh, layout of the 63rd Street and Lee Road. Uh, trail. So as part of the uh, a 2.5 million dollar, 2.2 million dollar grant that we received from the Next Level Trails, um, and so we're in the process now of finishing up the design, doing the acquisition, and then we hope to start construction sometime early next year with um, uh, the contract being let yet this year. Um, Just for the record, it's a $1.7 million grant, and we had a $500,000 match, so total project is $2.2 million. Um, another item that we uh, got done this year, uh, already this year, is the Alexander Park Playground. We put an uh, inclusive playground in at Alexander Park that uh, really serves that community along uh, Pendleton Pike, uh, the, um, the neighborhood there, and also the... Uh, the uh, mobile home facility that's there. We uh, purchased a storage shed, exciting, but Fall Creek Little League was in need of additional storage, and so we did purchase a storage shed um, and have it placed on the property there at Community Park for Fall Creek Little League. Signage at both uh, Burns Park and um, Explore Park were completed this year. Uh, we have two more park locations to go to, and then we'll finish out our um, our signage uh, within the park system. We have to thank our intern that was here for many years. He did a great job in designing that. Um, it's uh, it really accents our uh, our parks, I believe. Uh, we completed this year with the help of the council appropriating additional funds the fall creek baseball lighting at community park so we've got a brand new set of lights uh, on field two there and um, 
The kids really enjoy those those new lights, and it's their directional LED lights. So they're much more efficient than what was up there previously. We did complete uh, Civic Plaza and had a donate a dedication earlier this year. Uh, we I don't know if we got a picture of the. We uh, have a new playground that we haven't installed yet at Community Park. It's a two to five year old playground. All of our playgrounds are, are, have been five to 12. So we uh, purchased a piece uh, earlier this year that will, um, which lends itself to the smaller kids, those two to five year olds. And um, we'll have additional signage. So uh, hopefully we'll keep the, the bigger kids off that, but it's a, it'll be a great little piece to put in there. Um, we've also purchased exercise equipment to put out at Lee Road Park. We're going to put around the, uh, the nature trail and also out in the park location, uh, their uh, fitness uh, apparatus where you can go do uh, physical fitness and, and, and then have a, an area you could jog on or, or walk to. We have the continual build out of the cultural campus. Um, it's a beautiful facility, however, um, with more use. We have to seed it more often. We have to fertilize. We've got some electrical issues there. We've got to continue to work through. Has some irrigation issues. So that's a continual um, uh, item that we have to address. We've, I mentioned the acquisition of the easements and the awarding of the contracts for the Lee Road and 63rd Street uh, Trail. And then uh, lastly, we've got some build out we're going to do at Lee Road Park. Um, along with our pickleball courts we've already got, we're going to put in some bocce ball courts and some um, cornhole pits and cornhole. Um, and then um, so we'll have some additional programming there. Uh, moving into 24, uh, we uh, hope to start. Um, Again, the Lee Road Trail on, we hope to start on January, February of that. Uh, we hope to secure funding. We should hear something on the uh, Next Level Trail 4 application that, that uh, Corey and her team put in, um, along with some other partners from Indy and, and DPW and, and others. Um, we're asking for $5 million on that project. And that will essence take the trail from 63rd and Lee Road down Lee Road to 71st Street across and then follow along Fall Creek all the way to the uh, Kroger Loop Trail that uh, Indianapolis, again, the only Indianapolis property that's owned in the city of Lawrence. Um, we're continuing our expansion of um, league offerings with CCA that's been a great credit um, so far, they're uh, primarily adult programming, but it's um, uh, softball, pickleball. Um, we'll get the bocce ball and have some other things, but it's a great uh, partnership that we've got there. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, exciting things like uh, two new trucks, a new mower, a new gator this next year, which is fun for me, but uh, the Parks Department has tried over the many years, and again, it's, it's tough when you're competing with the other departments, but we try to get our trucks out every seventh year, our lawnmowers every fifth year, our bigger tracks, or tractors and, and dump trucks out every 15 years. So um, we're keeping a, keeping a uh, watch on those. Um, with the additional Rentals we had at uh, the community center and the community activity center and Gen Park. We're looking at some facelifts to do at each one of those facilities, primarily the activity center because it's rented almost every weekend. It's a very uh, cost effective place to, for people to go. And uh, so we hope to do some work in 2024 there. Um, we are already planning the, and I'm sure uh, Corey will discuss this later, the total eclipse 
uh, program on April the 8th next year. Uh, should be an exciting event. We're right in the path of total, total totality. Um, sounds ominous, but, um, <laughs> and uh, so we, we hope to continue that. Um, I mentioned Jen, Jen Park and, and an event trailer of all things, um, Again, Corey has brought a lot of events and activities to the community, and uh, so but we're always moving tables and chairs, PA systems, um, and it's you know it's it's a, it's a nice uh, problem to have. But we're looking at a trailer that we can actually place tables in, place chairs in our PA system, so one or two guys can just pick it up and go, and we don't have to cancel a reservation or steal from Peter to pay Paul so we'll uh, do it in that fashion so um, it's not exciting stuff but it's still about twenty thousand dollars worth of material we have to buy and uh, lastly uh, Corey said there was a Amy that called regarding the uh, inquiry or regarding a splash pad we are looking at that we, we, it's it's on our one of our burners, I'm not sure which one, but uh, the, with the help of the foundation, they're looking at uh, helping us fund that, so we're gonna continue on that effort. But um, it won't be next year, but it could be in the next couple of years. So we're gonna keep working on that, and we'll, um, we'd love to have one, and I, I know it'd be well utilized here in the community. So that's uh, my spiel. If anybody's got any questions, I'd be more than happy to as I'm walking over there, <laughs> hang on, wait your turn. <laughs> he said Liz had one over here first. Uh, how many acres of park land do you take care of? We have just a little over 300 acres. We actually mow almost 240 acres a week. Um, that's, that's a nice what green Liz space. Is talk about, I'm that's sure. That's right. <laughs> so Liz, do you have a question or a comment? Which park is an indie park? The the uh, loop trail behind Kroger at Fall Creek, and that's the only park property that's owned by Indy. That's in, in Lawrence. Lawrence. Yep. Yep. They used to own a parcel where your house is, actually, and we traded that many years ago for Veterans Park. They own 20 acres there on Sunnyside. Where your actually we yeah, where your home is. All right, Mr. Vest, do you have a question? I'm gonna, I'm gonna lump them together. Eric, uh, explain to the folks gathered how many full-time employees this department has, and also maybe share you know Lawrence Forever was known as the home of youth sports. Roughly how many participants? The overwhelming majority are non-Lawrence citizens who are using the facilities for free. How many? Uh, youth uh, participate in the sports that we provide and then lastly what are some of our beyond the general fund monies the department gets what revenue generation sources does the parks department have we have our non-reverting i'll answer that one first our non-reverting um, non-reverting account which roughly f raises about 150 to 200 thousand dollars a year and that's all rentals on facilities program fees from um, some of our adult sports that play like uh, soccer and, and uh, softball and those monies stay. And then any, again, any donated monies that come to us goes into that account. Um, but it has to be spent on, it can't be spent for salaries or, or anything else, it has to be spent on programs or um, facilities. Uh, question on number of employees. There's um, in total seven full-time employees for this parks department. Um, this year we had three seasonal. Um, down from years ago when Jeff was one of my seasonal employees, uh, we had we had eight or ten back then. It was hard to control that many. Fellows, but uh, but uh, what was your last question? Uh, how many number of participants in our sports? Uh, soccer has roughly 
5,000 annually uh, in the two spring and summers. Um, the baseball groups, we have uh, veterans, OYO, and there's 1,200 in the uh, spring league and about 900 in the fall league. So two to 2,500, and then their travel program. Uh, Fall Creek Little League has increased this year. They were up to about 300 kids for their, and they're now registering for their fall program. Youth football, um, that fluctuates, but uh, there's probably three to 400 kids involved in youth football. Thank you. Um, you can see that Tyler pulled up this proposed Fall Creek Greenway extension. Um, and so I want to share with you why it's important, because you might say, why are we going that way? Well, that is part of the state's visionary trail system. And so people, as we get this connection done, will be able to go on a bike or walk all the way downtown eventually, um, if they keep connecting with how the trails go. Part of this visionary trail system um, is key to really creating that additional connectivity for us. We um, are able to apply two ways to the DNR for a grant, and we can do one regionally or we can do a local one. We opted to do this regional one because we were just awarded a local one. Uh, they received about 60, Five thousand sixty-two thousand dollars in grant applications and sixty excuse me, sixty-two million. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and they're only gonna award about twenty-two and a half million. So we've asked for five. We have our fingers crossed. We put together a very comprehensive three hundred and ninety-one page novel for them to read with all the requirements that they needed. So um, we feel good about a strong application. But it is really key to connecting, and another way to make sure that you might get that award is through um, making sure that you're working on some of the connectivity that we need to happen um, there. In addition to the five million, we do have a match, if we are awarded, of 1.75 million from Lilly Endowment. So we're really excited to be able to have that. Um, that's being um, distributed to us through CICF if this grant is awarded. Any questions for Parks? Oh, does the city after the Lily match have to come up with funds for the trails? Um, our only requirement for this particular grant is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a pretty good ratio, isn't it? Do you know when you might get a an idea if you've been awarded the grant? The DNR is to make the award in December of this year. Does the Parks Department have a goal still to repave community park parking lots? Yes, it's, um, it's outlined in the, oh, I'm sorry. It is, it is outlined in our budget. Um, uh, pardon me? One of the lines. Yeah, it's one of the lines. It's, uh, uh, it's a 444 account. I have to actually look to see which one it was. But yes, we did ask for, uh, right at 1.5 million for that so. yeah I mean it, we're it we keep kicking this can down the road and it's it's not getting any better so we're gonna we're gonna we have to to do it sometime so um, yeah it did help um, but again that's that was a resourcefulness of, that street department provided that Jim did with his crews, uh, but that's only a temporary fix. And I think we have one more question. Okay, I'll limit it to one. Um, I live on Lee Road, and I'm so excited about the improvements over where the pickleball courts are. Mm -hmm. With adding all those other things, are you going to have to have an expense for adding more lighting? Are they ever going to put restrooms over there? 
There are restrooms there now, actually, uh -huh. uh, and we're in the 20th century, maybe, 21st century, yeah. <laughs> They're actually on uh, automatic locks. They open at 8 o'clock in the morning and they close at 8 o'clock in the evening. Um, our only issue was we had one set of vandalism that tore some stuff up, but uh, we haven't had that since, so but yes, they are open daily. You can see that some of the expenditures that we make are um, to really look at our efficiencies and how we can make sure that we're having more maintenance done in our parks. So the trailer for the events, because we have more events, and having that in the long run will save a lot of manpower hours. Ha not having to have someone come back in the evening and pay overtime to be locking bathroom doors um, and being able to go to these automatic lock systems. So how do we keep looking at in making some investments and being able to um, keep our um, people in the parks helping beautify them and work on some of the other things we need to do. So there's a lot of talk in some of this investment that we do about creating some more efficiencies to better serve the citizens of Lawrence. So with those restrooms, those locking, we've bought the software, so we have a laptop, we can just go out now. It, we're putting them in at uh, Play Park on Oak Landon Roads, our next facility, to, so we can put them to timer. The city's uh, deductible is $10,000, so we, uh, <laughs> we, try to, uh, we try to make them as vandal-proof as possible, um, but yes. My kids don't want me to get on the parks because I have a heart condition. And I've seen where there are emergency phone boxes. I think it's on the Monon I've seen them in mm -hmm. other places. Is that something that's ever been considered? Uh, we are in discussion of cameras uh, for some of our park locations as a, not to facilitate that, but, um, but we do have Wi-Fi capabilities in most of the parks, so you can, of course, Call for, call for. Yes, yes. Um, pardon me. Yeah, well, that's that too. Um, but the cameras we're looking at um, putting in primarily at community park uh, to uh, some of the vandalism issues we've had there and some of the um, parking issues we've had, um, and that's hopefully we'll we'll complete those cameras next year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. And we have one question back here. I know it's early in regards to um, the splash pad, but at this time, do you have any possible locations in mind? Well, there again, we've, uh, we've looked at Community Park just because that's our largest park location. Um, we've talked about Lee Road Park also because it's um, centrally located. So. Uh, once we determine our funding sources, then we'll we'll do a uh, community outreach to see where the most demand is and where we can actually put it. Uh, it might be on a location that's not a park property. Um, you know, this is the large one on Franklin Road, 5300 North Franklin Road. It this spans one. between Franklin and Post Road, so it's a biggie. There's some room there. Um, but we've had we've had discussions at Community Park just because we have the infrastructure there to to handle it. Um, but again, it doesn't require that we put it in a park location. If there's something else available, we'll look at that. So if any of you win the lottery or you know someone who would like to fund it, please see me after this meeting. <laughs> I didn't win. All right. I think we're good. Have anything before we turn it over to Shri? Oh, Tyler has something. Here you go, Tyler. Yeah, we're gonna bring up Shri and Jim for the next set. So we'll do stormwater and then we'll go right in the streets. Uh, I didn't put a chart together for this because it's not chart worthy, but just a brief history on stormwater. Um, so stormwater, we, we historically were part of the Marion County Stormwater District and we pulled out and created our own Lawrence Stormwater District in I mean, 2020. So what that did is 
Well, it's not a property tax, but it's a user fee that gets paid during the property tax distributions. Uh, and that actually brought in $2 million back into the, locally here in the city of Lawrence. So no one had an increase of fees, but now those fees are being brought to the city. Um, and so that's actually given some funding uh, to Shri, our city engineer. And so that brought really our local money back into Lawrence. We, I think we've only identified one project that happened in Lawrence through the Marion County Stormwater District. So since we brought those funds back, we've been able to do a significant amount of stormwater improvements. So we're gonna start with really what we've accomplished and what Shree would like to accomplish in 2024. Yeah, uh, just like Tyler mentioned, we are almost bringing a little over $2 million every year for stormwater, uh, as part of the stormwater revenue. It goes up every year because for the uh, statue that is a small increase every year that that is added to the stormwater fees every year. So we, we go from 2 to 2.05 to 2.1. So we usually program it for $2 million when we budget it. Um, so um, last, uh, this year, um, we, we did start the uh, first, of, we did start our first drainage project, which was the Rainbow Lane uh, in Pine Hill Drive drainage improvements. That's basically wrapping up right now. In the next two weeks, those streets are gonna get uh, paved. Um, if anybody get uh, get a chance, just drive through those two streets. They, are, they look, they just look good. We even included some hybrid ditches, which is basically, um, you know, ditches will take water in on Rainbow Lane instead of putting pipes. So that's kind of a, a green infrastructure we put in on, uh, on Rainbow Lane. Um, so that is currently wrapping up. We also uh, got a 600,000 grant through the OCRA, which is the Office of the Community and Rural Affairs with the state. We applied for it last November, and we got it awarded uh, March for a drainage improvements project in Brookside Park neighborhood. So that is roughly uh, around 1.4 million. So city will uh, uh, pitch in around $800,000 and Okra will give $600,000. So I just got the final blessing from Okra last week and we have issued a uh, contract to the contractor. Uh, the contract was bid out through the, the bidding process um, and the contractor was uh, selected through the uh, process. So we, uh, the, I think they're going to start uh, working on the project uh, sometime in September. So that is the second project that we are funding it through our stormwater revenue. Um, we are also uh, plan doing some design on some other projects that are um, that we need to do as part of the master plan we did back in 2020. Um, those designs are ongoing, so my goal is for the next year to find out ways to fund those projects. Those projects will be ready for construction next year. So the goal is to start uh, find out funding sources to bid those projects and get those going uh, next year. Um, also. Part of the stormwater revenue, we I always set aside uh, some money for ongoing repairs uh, because people call in with complaints about drainage issues that has not been addressed several years. So we, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have caught up on a lot of those repairs in the last year and this year. We have a contractor nonstop working on those repairs. Um, uh, you know, every time we come in, a, compl a complaint comes in, I go check on it, and um, between Jim's team and the contractor, we go, they go and fix those, um, so that that has tremendously helped alleviate a lot of the uh, the minor concerns with uh, pe people's backyards being flooded or driveway being flooded because those are not like big projects. But we never had the uh, the resources or the money to address those and every time those complaints came in it went to Indianapolis and you know it's been sitting there so now with a dedicated source of funding it comes to us and we have set aside um, a cl close to a half a million dollar each year to fix those repairs and we have been doing it and we do it year around we have a list that we go out of we uh, and people are um, you know there are a lot of people who are really happy that we have addressed the problems that has not been addressed um, the best way to do is to report up any see a flooding issue just report it through our website or uh, call DPW and report it. Um, and then, um, you know, we I usually tell everybody, give us a few weeks to look at the problem, figure out the solution. So uh, we will get to it if it is something that is in the city's uh, right away or in the easement. So uh, we continue to, we plan to do that next year too. Every year we're going to set aside so much money for stormwater um, repairs uh, that are not projects. 
So that is uh, that is kind of what I uh, you know you know we have it planned and budgeted for stormwater for next year. Um, so it's really good things happening on the drainage side, and we are able to catch up on a lot of the on the issues. Anything else? I didn't forget. Um, so why don't we, we're ahead of schedule, so we'll take questions on stormwater before we do a streets revenue presentation and then go right into, yeah. Uh, has the paving of Franklin Road started yet? Uh, well, we're going to get to do that after the storm. Oh, okay. Stormwater. Um, I know of a property that floods, and in the past there's been a, an attempt to fix it, and I think that was probably when the city of Indianapolis was involved. If we're going to communicate with you, what's the easiest thing to do? Uh, I would Here, say so. Pictures, I, invite you over. I just wanted to be very clear. A property can flood due to multiple reasons. Yeah. So many times when I go to the property, the property is flooding because there is some issues with property. There is nothing. The water is not getting into the road or getting into an inlet. So uh, I know people don't want to hear that, but a lot of the times there is a property issue that is creating a flooding in the property backyard. Either it's not graded right, or there is a big hole that water is not getting, or somebody had they or they themselves have put a fence that is blocking water from getting out of the property. So usually, when I get a property uh, complaint, um, and again, to uh, how to comply, how to put a complaint is or raise an issue is if we go to our website, there is a link there that you can submit issues. Um, we can attach pictures to that, and it will come to uh, to DPW and to me, and I'll take a look at it. We usually reach out to the property owner if there is a contact information. Uh, after I review it and let them explain to them if this is an issue that city will address or if there's an issue that the property owner can address. And I usually um, even recommend what they can do based on my engineering uh, review. I would tell them, hey, you can do such and such things. Uh, once you get the water into the street or into that manhole, we'll, we'll make sure that it goes into the goes from there. Uh, so I even uh, give them contact information of contractors if they want to use a contractor. So we help them out. Again, once they get it into the into the city's uh, system, and if it is still not working, we'll fix it. We'll we'll clean it up. We have a contractor who can clean it, who can put a camera in and see what's going on who can grade ditches and uh, fix pipes. So it's kind of a two-step process based on what the issue is. Thank you. So, well, again, just report it to us through the website, and I, before I say no, I would go there and look at it, and if there is an easement, there's issues, well, like a lot of the times, these properties has been there for too long and people have built, they don't know there is an easement. So if you go look at the property from this side, people have built all kinds of stuff along that easement. So it's supposed to be a drainage easement, and when you block the natural flow of water with sheds and fences, unfortunately, you're going to create a problem. And it's not what this property or the properties next to it, or the five properties next to it have built it. And I come across those scenarios, and it's just a hard thing. I can't just take a, a you know, piece of equipment and start demoing all the things that they built. So, But I try to help. I kind of get the right-of-way easements and stuff like that to get in and fix that. So just report it to us, and we'll take a, definitely go take a look at it, and we'll see what we can do. You're talking, you got an issue about four or five years ago, Greg. Yeah. I used to, it's my well, we had, we had, there, we my had an apartment house. complex hire fluid waste. They cleaned all them pipes, right? And you didn't have the problem for a while, right? That's well, what I sort of, but there's trees all yeah, growing where the water's supposed to go across the back of the property and then down. Yeah. yeah, just report it to us that like we, we have a process that we go through before we say we can do it or not. So, and 90% uh, of the times, if we can do it, we'll do it. I mean, you will get it uh, taken care of. Thank you for the um, answers to your question. I do have one sure. coming up. It's in regards to lead testing of the pipes. Is that on our agenda? Um, we need to start looking at that. Is for the water. 
So that, that is portable water, the drinking water. And I think the best person who can answer this, uh, if you go to the USB meeting, I think Scott is the only person. Um, you know, drinking water is under the utilities department. So I can't answer that. But I know that Scott is aware of that issue, and he has brought it up, and what the process is, what nationally we are there, do everybody's doing, what are the guidelines out there. So I know he's aware of it. Deb, if, and if you want to send an email to me or somebody else, we can get you some information on that. Well, for, to that one, I'll have, I'll tell, I'll let Scott know you're, you're asking because he's, I believe, I don't want to jump ahead of him, but he will be bringing, I think, to the council um, a grant specifically on lead line inventory. Um, so I think he's gets, he gets excited about that stuff. So um, I'll let him know, though. Yeah. Let him know for sure. And everybody's asking the same question about because it's all over the news, too. Well, that's right? that's PF. Yes, that's yeah. also something else that's yeah, happening. Yeah, there's a whole acronym so about that. So there's a that. whole different thing, and then there's the lead pipe. There's two different things, but um, Scott will definitely, and just the reason we're not talking about it today, and you didn't see it here, is utilities is its own LLC, and so it has its own budget, and it doesn't come out of our general fund. I do have another question. Please remind me. Sure. When we pulled out of the Indianapolis, was there not an X amount of money we still have to pay back? Correct. So the two million is on top of what's left. Of no, no. So we basically, so can you like I said, clarify that, please. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we have to still pay the debt services, which is I think which is under, until 2034 or 33, something like that. So we, uh, depending on each year, we pay but somewhere between 270 to 320. So every year it's kind of a, a you know this year I think it might be 310. Last year, so that is in the schedule that was approved by the council and the, through the resolution. So that has to have that will come out of this 2.1 or 2. Point. Then um, we do pay. I mean, since Marion County is collecting the the stone water and giving it to us, we pay. I think it's three dollars per uh, property. So uh, as a as a fee to Marion County to collect that. So uh, so that is so we roughly spend around three fifty thousand dollars. Three. I mean, somewhere between three twenty to three fifty between the debt services and the collection fees. Um, and then, but the again, you know, going from zero, we didn't have anything before. Now going from zero dollars to even 1.7 is still a big chunk for us and a big part of money for us to, us to work with. Thank you. I just want to correct one thing as well. I said utilities was its own LLC. It's actually its own governing body. It's not an LLC. So I just wanted to correct that for the record so that um, you knew that. Any other questions about stormwater? I just don't know who to call or what a phone number. The best thing to do is to literally go on the website and I'm going to show you how here. So we've been, you know, we kind of went away. I mean, the best way to report these things on our website. That is a form there which you can put in. Yeah, we can show yeah, it. Okay. So I, you know, it, that, that way it's documented. It comes to us. It gets assigned to a number, um, and then it, it gets forwarded. So that is that is what we've been recommending everybody is. You know, it, it literally takes less than five minutes to submit that form. Now you can attach form or photos in the pictures, um, anything in there to send it to us and you know put address there and that. Same website, we can get complaints about trash and all that stuff too. So there are different forms. Twenty twenty four, Deb. I think we will have at least three projects. One is the uh, uh, Lawrence Terrace and Chamberlain Station. There is drainage improvements. And there is an Oakland. Then Oakland. I can't remember the name of that. So there is three projects that are currently in design. Um, that will be ready for construction. And these projects were in the master plan when we submitted the, when we requested the bond, we had to do a master plan, and two of those projects were in that master plan. And that one other project is based on a complaint. Like uh, when I um, requested the bond, I always said that there is a project that's gonna come out of the blue. 
um, that is not in the master plan, and this third project is that project, that kind of project. It's a much smaller project, but it just came out of the blue, and we had to do some design. So there will be three projects that will be ready to do construction uh, next year. So, so um, the, my, my thing is to come back to the council for another bond, see if we can get some, because uh, these projects are around five, four to $5 million combined uh, construction costs, and you are already past two years, so the cost is just is going out. So, um, Okra, I, I refer to the Okra grant, right? So, Okra, uh, the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, for to qualify those for those grants, you have to meet some income criteria. Meet some in <laughs> income criteria, um, so not all those, not the other two projects that we are doing fall under the, that area that will qualify for the income. Uh, it has to be a low income. It has to fall under so much criteria. So not all the projects qualify for that. Fortunately, Brookside Park, that area qualified under that income criteria, so we were able to apply for that. These three other locations will not. Uh, satisfy those requirements. So we have to, uh, and there is not a lot of grant opportunities for stormwater. Water, wastewater, you have a lot of other grant opportunities. So it, just like what other cities like Indianapolis did, they issued a massive bond back in 2020 for just for drainage projects. So because there is not a lot of other grant sources out there, you can um, fund these projects, you know. And uh, luckily, we have a dedicated revenue source from stormwater that has to be used only on stormwater. So this money cannot be used on anything else. So that revenue is there. And it is a great thing to uh, you know, have and the great source to use it towards a bond, you know, to do some of these projects. And that is how other communities are doing. It, again, there is not other grand opportunities out there. Do you see the possibility of HPD or SPD to So, uh, it's, so two things we can do. So every year it's going to go up because the the ordinance we passed follows Indianapolis's stormwater fees. So every year I think it's it changes five it's uh, five cents to thousand square feet or, or there's a calculation. So when we first got it, it was one point nine. So now we are at two point, but it's not a massive increase. It's like sixty thousand dollars increase every year. So we can, as a city, the, the way we did it back in 2020 was we just accepted their ordinance and went with their rates. We can also always do our own rate study and come up with our own rates and see, okay, are we, for, you know, are we good at these rates or do we want to change our rates from Indianapolis and make our own rate, rate structure? So that is something that is out, out there. Or we can wait until 2034 when this, uh, this whole thing is done and uh, do that too. So that is more like a legal thing, but there are, there are things that we can look at how to increase this revenue. Oh. <laughs> did, did you copy me? I mean, did you hear? So if we, when, when we build, like empty fields, when they get built, there's a, there's a stormwater tax that goes on that. So that's more money that would come to us. So that's, that's why we got to get a lot of building going. Oh, maybe she's got a question for you. Oh. Can we talk loud? Yeah, well, scream at us. All right. Jen Park was, it was given to us by the Jen Corporation. That was actually owned by the employees of, Jen, of the Jen Corporation. Uh, Lou Jen provided that facility to them. They paid a annual stipend to maintain the facility. And uh, when they closed and, and their employee um, recreational fund, they actually donated that to the city. So that, but we did name it after Mr. Jan, yes. Does, do you actively pursue like a relationship with an attorney who does estate planning or develop those kind of relationships? My parents gave a whole bunch away. Mm -hmm. 
and I grew up in Lawrence. They didn't give any to Lawrence because by then they moved other places. But uh, do you have a grant writer? Do you contact we, out we grant We have writing? our Park Foundation in its infancy that will be helping us with uh, with grants of that sort, with uh, um, that sort of estate funding. So that'd be great. Here is the Department of Public Works phone number, 317-545-8787. That was for your question. So there's the DPW number. Jim made a good point. He wants to distinguish the two different phone numbers, so different issues. Cover what, if they call that number for Department of Public Works, what you know services or response can you do? Court enforcement. Basically, uh, while code violations. Basically, if, if you see somebody having a, a grass not cut or trash property, that's the number you call. But again, if you go to the how do I, can you click on the how do I, please? If you go to, uh, so, if, yeah. So you see a report a code violation. So if you do that, you can, like I said, it's a pretty easy form you fill out. You don't have to put, if you don't want, if you want to stay anonymous, you can do that. You can just put the property address, put a picture, attach a picture of what you're seeing and send it to us. It will come directly to them and any of that. I recommend everybody to do that because it's a streamlined process. So when you call in, yeah, we're going to take it, but the, the action on it might take a little bit of time because based on who receives the call and how it gets forwarded. But this one is pretty streamlined. You can do the safety concerns, the same thing. Um, you know, if you want to issue a report, a street issue or a pothole, that's, that's again, it's, this, this will literally take less than five minutes to submit this form. But again, then the phone number is always available. If something happens, you can submit it, or you don't have a computer uh, or internet, then yeah, definitely call us um, about permits, code violation, um, uh, about, uh, drainage issues. Uh, all comes to DPW. But if it is a street issue or a pothole, then there is a different number if you get it. That's a street department. There you go. Yep. Because the, the way the, the website is set up that if you click on this and submit a form, it will go to Jim's. So if you'd rather call us, we, we have to get the information, pass it on to their call. So that is a whole process that that's why we, this is so much easier and streamlined to submit that form. We use the online forms as work orders, too, so that's how we do it. But if, if, if an elderly person was to call my office, Denise would fill one out for her and then get it done to me. So that's... Yes, ma'am. Just call, just call, just call, just call 8235. I mean, if you call me by mistake for him or him by me, we, we, we communicate. We, we communicate. We make sure... We make sure it gets where... Even, even I, get, I get utility calls. I still ship it right over there. It's no, it's no big deal. I got one more answer. <laughs> I called, it wasn't anonymous, about a neighbor parking their business vehicle on the street and right in the way, and I was told that it that was City of Indianapolis that had to deal with it, not you guys. So, two things, right? We don't do zoning enforcement. We can't. Legally, we cannot have that. We d so if somebody calls the DPW and say, hey, this property owner is starting a business in a residential uh, zoned one, all we can do is open up Indianapolis's website and submit a ticket just like you would do. So we would do, we do it all the time. But we don't, I cannot send our enforcement inf inspector to t find them because legally we don't have that authority. Indianapolis, Marion County still have the zoning enforcement authority. So that is why they said the business, if there is a business running out of a, a residential, please call D uh, Indianapolis DMD and report it, or you can go to their website and report it. And if you call us, we do the same thing, and we'll be more than happy to do it. And we submit the request, they give you a case number, you can look at the case number, they are, it'll show updates every week. It'll, so that is there. Regarding the, the vehicle parked on the street, if it is a, a city street and it's designated for parking and there is no, no parking enforcement, anybody can park. 
you know if the part of the building if the vehicle gets moved every other day if the vehicle is staying there not not being touched for three or four days yes we can tag it and tow it but if it is somebody is coming there and parking um, a business truck on the street unless it's it's designated as no parking or parking during certain hours or certain uh, information anybody can park on the street and he can take the vehicle he or she can take the vehicle the next morning go to work come back and park um, that is that is how the law says, and uh, not DPW. Nobody can do anything about it. So the only way to change it is to change it to a no parking or put some ordinance with uh, you know specific timing enforcement or so stuff like that. I'm not going to quote the city ordinance. I don't know it very well. But if a, if a truck is longer than 13 or 14 foot, or it's more than seven foot high, it cannot be parked on. There's a city ordinance. If there's a boat trailer. Uh, Landscaping, any kind of trailer, trailer oh. vehicle, you cannot park it on there. That is, that a of? City, oh, ordinance. That is a city ordinance. That's when you call five four five seven five seven five. That's the police department. And they'll come out and ticket it. There is a city ordinance that does cover parking a large vehicles in neighborhoods, right. like semis. You can't do that. I don't even know what property you're talking about. Where are you at? Mardike Lane? Well, there should be no public parking in the street anyway. There's no curbs there. Just before we go any further. Just before we go any further, I want to make sure I didn't do a good job introducing these two gentlemen. So Shree Venegoflin, he is our city engineer. And Jim Hennigan, besides being the resident phone directory, <laughs> because he has them all memoried. He is our, <laughs> that's right, he is our uh, director of st our streets department. So thank you. Now, um, any more questions before we move on to streets? You can go on the city's website and look up city ordinance. You can go on and look up city ordinances. And, and, and that, and, oh yeah, yeah, yes, and that, that's a great tool for you to have, I mean. Say any street. So any street that is designated as no parking, it's laid out, it's spelled in our city ordinance. There's an ordinance which says every street in the city which is a no parking or a four-way stop, those are laid out. What intersections, streets, so what side, they're all laid out. If you don't see that, yeah, street in that, that means the parking is allowed. And that'll conclude stormwater. So with that, actually, we are back on, well, stormwater and DPW, but we're back on time. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to do a quick streets. I pulled up here, too, where you can see the municipal code is in the quick link. So before I close that down, that's on the front page. Um, yeah, let's jump back into a quick financial, like just a revenue discussion on the streets department, and then we will uh, hand it over to Jim here to close this out. Uh, so the first kind of chart I put together here is just a 2023 year to date. So this is as of July 1st. It just compares each month to the previous year's uh, month. So we were seeing quite a good, consistent growth in our gas tax. And so the street department's primary funding source to maintain roads, um, whether that's full reconstruction, pothole repair, strip patching, crack sealing, or even snow removal uh, and or even treatment, so salt, and then even tree removal, all is funded by the gas tax. So there's two funds, so just combine them here. You have the Motor Vehicle Highway Fund, we'll call it the MVH Fund, but Motor Vehicle Highway Fund and the Local Road and Streets Fund, they both get gas tax. And so that's the total street department funding uh, that they have to operate um, to do their job. <clears throat> so overall, this paints what would be pretty much a good picture, but realistically, our revenue this year is up and projected to be up from last year about 40 grand. So that's not a significant increase. And so the gas tax is when, when you're at the pump and then that's what we're collecting. We get it back from the state. So this paints a decent picture. It's good to see, you know, things have rebounded since 2020 um, when COVID hit and people stopped driving. And you can actually see that on this next chart here. <clears throat> if you look at 2018 on the far left, we received $3.1 million in gas tax. 
Fast forward to 2023, that yellow bar there, that's the 23 estimates, we're gonna bring in 3.1 million. So as we've consistently talked about, you heard it last night, cost increasing, you have fire engines going up 40% plus, trucks are, costs are increasing. But the revenue source that these uh, individuals need to use to operate and maintain our streets is flat. So we took a pretty big hit uh, in 2020, and so everyone stopped driving during COVID. And so we saw that with $2.5 million coming in. It was nice in 21 and 22 to see that positive rebound. Uh, but again, we're just now getting back to 2018 levels. And so one of the things that have further kind of hamstringed us is something that the state did. Uh, they had instituted, I believe it was back in 18 or 19, that 50% of the gas tax going into the MVH fund had to be restricted. And so the restricted uses are only full reconstruction, strip patching, or crack sealing. So no pothole repairs are in those funds. You cannot pay salaries. You can't use it for salt or snow removal. So a lot of the street um, functions that we have, we're automatically restricted on our uses. And so some of the unrestricted uses, we see those costs continue to climb. You know, they, they have their hands kind of tied. And so it's, it's a unfortunate situation here. You know, it's, it kind of goes back to the very first chart where we talked about our revenue sources. We have very, very limited control over what we receive here in the city of Lawrence. Um, but, you know, we can talk about some of the things and Jim can give us a history lesson on what he's been able to accomplish even as far back as 2018. And so it's pretty crazy really to look at some of the things and it's something he's really proud of is what he's been able to accomplish on such a tight kind of funding source. You look at what he's done from 18 all the way to 23, while the revenue's not really increased, he's still been able to get a lot done. Um, he'll talk a little bit about some of his um, much needed grant resources. So we leverage and strategize to get some much needed grants to take those dollars and stretch them as much as possible. So um, that's kind of a quick, you know, unfortunately the street department does a lot on little and we appreciate that. 2024 will be roughly the same. I think we'll bring in about three, 3.2 million. So we won't see another significant increase. And so that's one of the areas I'm concerned with is right now they haven't really seemed to address the electric vehicle situation. So those cars don't pay the gas tax because they're not buying gas. And so as we see that pick up, I'll be interested to see what happens. And so that's another funding challenge that the state hamstringed us on the 50-50 split and restricting our gas tax funds. I'll be interested to see if they come up with a solution on the EV, uh, on the electric vehicle front before that problem becomes much larger. So, um, you know, and Lawrence here, we're, we're pushing for electric vehicles. It's a nice thing to have, but it presents a separate challenge that we, um, we look to address in the future. So with that, Jim, I'll kick it off to you. All right, everybody's wanting to know, and, and me and Shree work together on paving. He, he gets the grants for the, what's the CMG. He can speak more on that here in a second, but he, we, we, we've, we've done 6,225 pothole. I mean, but it's not, it don't seem like a lot of number, but it's going down with Shree's help with doing roads. Our potholes are going down, which is awesome. I don't know, we are sidewalk replacements. That's the, you'd call us for sidewalk. You know, we got trip hazards, but, uh, he, like you mentioned, Franklin Road's going to start concrete work first. I'm going to let him speak on that because he knows the thing. Uh, we got strip patching started. We went, him and I went out today about four hours and marked up a bunch of places. And it's going to be, uh, Winding Ridge is going to be one of them. The uh, Fairways East. I mean, if you, got, you guys are familiar with the Winding Ridge, that place has never had top put on it. It's, it's just terrible. So that is going to get done, hopefully, we get all the money, we should get done next year. So I'm gonna let Shree touch on CMG because that's his pipe paving part is kind of Shree's deal. So I'm gonna let him take off on that and we'll go off on other stuff. I mean, I think it's worth mentioning. Hello. So just what Jim didn't mention clearly was we replaced 1500 feet of sidewalk, Jim and his, yeah. and his crew. I mean, that is, that is a lot of sidewalk that got replaced you know, this year. And uh, we have his crew and contractors working nonstop on sidewalks almost all year round. Um, uh, so that is, that is and 6,025 potholes, it's a, still a lot of That's potholes a for a, a crew like what Jim has. He does, I've got, I mean, I've the, got the, seven the, guys myself yeah, too, by with, the way. With everything else they have to do with cutting grass and you know sweeping streets and all that stuff. Here, here. Here's another kind of a, a we swept this, the whole entire city's been swept once this year. We've removed 200, almost 40 tons of debris off the roads. That's a lot. So that's what, and we're going to do it again in fall. We do it twice a year. So 
People say, call say, well, you did my street, but you didn't get in front of my house. Well, we get out there and there's cars parked there. Well, you know, we can't, we're not going to go back and do it because you left your car on the street. Yeah. So that's kind of, well, well, can you give us when we're going to be there? No, we don't know what weather's going to do. But, but yeah, that, that's a lot. I mean, that's, that's a lot of stuff removed. And, but sidewalks, it's ongoing. You know, that 823-8959, that's where you report your trip hazards. We try to, we work in a whole neighborhood. We don't just go get this house, this house. When we go in a neighborhood, we do the entire neighborhood. That way we don't have to keep going back and paying for, you know, mope fee. Uh, like Jim mentioned, we just today marked out a bunch of uh, roadways for which are candidates for strip patching. Um, so well, we'll have a contractor out there doing some of those strip patching in the next next three weeks. Um, so again, um, we we try to uh, uh, allocate money the best way we can because, like Tyler said, it's not an unlimited part. Three million is not a lot when you have to think about salaries, benefits, um, you know, buying salt and then doing paving and all that stuff. So that's where um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. We would love to go out and attack every single street and do strip patching and resurfacing, but. Um, we, I mean, we are working with a tight budget, so we kind of uh, have a system that 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 state tells us to use, and that's what we use on resurfacing. We strip patching is based on the complaints he receive, and we look at what candidate, what are candidates of those, because not a lot of streets are candidates for strip patching. You know, strip patching is a bandage, and you have to be that level of a street to get to receive strip patching. Um, so I can give you a prime example. We strip patched 56th Street between German Church and Carroll Road two years ago. Drive through that street right here. We yes. spent $70,000 on that strip patching. To drive through it today. It's it's come falling apart. So it's a candidate. Yeah, there is no more strip patching on that. Um, so it's a candidate for uh, resurfacing now. Yeah. So, but it's a half a million dollar resurfacing. You know. So, uh, so going back to the community crossing grant, last every last seven years we've been going after community crossing grant from Indart. Indart matches up to $1 million each year for resurfacing. It has to be re repaving, not tax ceiling, not strip patching. So we've been going, uh, we trying to match the $1 million. Um, last year, we, we just got, we got another million this year. So this year, between last year's uh, resurfacing and this year's, we almost will be finishing up around $3.7, $3.8 million of resurfacing this year. Um, we've already finished the Chesapeake and a bunch of other, you know, 79th and 75th back in April. We go, we starting a concrete work on Franklin Road this week. The sign should go up tomorrow, if not already. Uh, Franklin Road is supposed to be done by early October. Um, because they have a lot of concrete work they have to do before they come and pave it. And there is a bunch of other streets, like I think 49th and 51st, that are also going to get resurfaced. All of all of those are west of Franklin, uh, I think west of Richard even. So they are going to get done. Uh, the completion date is Thanksgiving for the contractor. So I'm hoping with the, uh, you know, the rain is not helping, but I'm still hopeful that we'll get it done this year. Um, so that is, that is ongoing, and then sidewalk repairs are continuing. Continuing to happen, strip patching. More strip patching is going to happen next two months, next month. So, uh, so that is that is things we are doing this year for next year. Uh, I want to do more paving. You know, I want to do roughly around three million dollar worth of paving with one million dollar match from India on the community crossing. And the way we want to do it, just like somebody raised uh, raised a question on ARPA, uh, the American Rescue Plan money that is sitting that is there. Use some of that. Um, the original plan did call for a uh, million dollar for paving. We didn't get that this year, but so this year's money is still there. And then we have the next year, so we can do more paving with that and get that million dollar match from Indart. We don't have to stop at our million dollar. We can do more, right? So if there is money out there that we can spend through ARPA, we can leverage that and get the million dollar and do three million because there is need. We can do 10 million if we want to because there are needs out there. There are roads out there. We can keep going and going. So we, we have a list together for that. Uh, we are working on submitting the application early next year. And I'm very hopeful. We Every time we submit it, we got it. So we will get, we will submit it, and we'll get that money, and we'll do um, maybe a little over, like close to three million dollars worth of, uh, depending on what the council approves the budget and how ARPA plays out. Well, our 
that's my hope is to you know to do close to three million dollar worth of paving next year and continue to do more strip patching you know um, so if ARPA comes in and helps with the patching, we can use some of the MVH money towards strip patching. And s some of them can go towards, then LRS can be used for sidewalks. So we can do all, we can play around with this budget depending on if we get a grant or not. And I, I didn't mention that when we do sidewalk repairs, we most of them are due to trees that's in the island in the right of way, so you're right, we remove them. I can't tell you how many trees we removed in Admiral's Landing, but it was a bunch. And that's a budget killer. But I was gonna give you, Tyler mentioned it on, on vehicles. Three years ago, I bought a tandem axle. You know, you guys remember, it's a three axle truck for a hundred and about $80,000. I just, we're getting in the process of buying a smaller single axle, $260,000. So three years difference, them trucks went up that much. That's, that's, a, that's a budget killer. So that's, you know, and that's, it's, it's reality. It's what we're, where we're living, but that's what it is. I, I want to mention about one couple more projects that are in design. The 75th and Oaklandon roundabout that was funded, that we got funded through MPO grant back in 2020. Last year, this MPO awarded us the the, uh, the money for building a roundabout at 75th and Oakland, and we started the design last year. It's going to be bid um, end of next year, and the construction will start 2025. Um, that is currently under design. It'll go to the land acquisition process. It has to go through the whole state process, so it takes a lot longer to design it. So it is still planned. The money when we got awarded was for 2025. So we are still on schedule to bid that project and construct in 2025. Um, and we also, um, we got a lot of complaints about 86 and Carroll Road. If anybody drove through that intersection, people don't stop. I mean, it's just like, so uh, working with Indianapolis, that intersection, 86 and Carroll, is one piece. We, we own one part of the intersection, Indianapolis on the north side, and Crawford's will Sorry, McCourt's will on the east side. So I was able to get financial commitments from Indianapolis and McCourt's will to have a combined uh, project done. It's in a, it's a great location for a roundabout. So they both, both Indianapolis and McCourt's will have committed uh, to financially support this project if we get if we get some kind of grant through MPO. So MPO has already. Uh, uh, called, uh, issued a call for projects, which are due in December. So we are going to submit for a roundabout project with the support from Indianapolis and McCourtsville to uh, to go after uh, to go to ask for money to build a roundabout there and keep that intersection safer, make that intersection safer. Again, it is just an application. They it has to go through the whole review process. We will not know um, if you will get it or not until like January or February of next year. But I'm very hopeful because we have some strong partners with us with some commitments too because we cannot do it by ourselves and it's an intersection owned by three different uh, municipalities so and uh, we were fortunate enough to get the other parties commit to it so I'm hopeful that MBO will look into that uh, sub, you know that teamwork and maybe uh, get us that money so again fingers crossed on that so one thing I'd like to touch on I got an email today about Pendleton Pike and Shadeland construction, post-road construction. The city of Lawrence is not involved in either of those projects. We don't have no control. Shree keeps in touch with Purple Line. People are, are thinking that we're a part, we don't have no part of it. We don't have no say, am I right, Shree? No, I mean, like, I wouldn't say that. Uh, Indi Indigo has, and Indianapolis has come to us with these projects. We, we, they work. They worked on Purple Line. They we work together. They address our public safety concerns about, hey, how access. They gave access to a police station. So, but that construction is inevitable. You know, the you, you, that's going to happen. You know, there is no going back. And I'm, I know it's a, a you know, it's an inconvenience for travelers, and it's going to happen for the whole rest of the year for Purple Line. You know, the, by the time Post Road will be completed, it's going to be next spring or summer. So there is going to be inconveniences, um, but they do. Work Work. If another, they, you know, we need more signs out there. They're more than happy to address that. They have provided access to everybody. But again, for people who commute through there, it's an inconvenience. You can't go. 
but it's it's going to happen. It's inevitable. There is no other good way to do that project. It's such a big project. You know, building a station in the middle of the road, there's not a good way. Franklin Road uh, resurfacing that we are doing as part of the repaving, it will have some inconvenience too, but it's not going to be fully closed. People can still go northbound and southbound all through the project. But whether they all have two lines open, probably not. It'll be one line uh, south, one line northbound. But it's not going to be a full closure. But again, it's going to have inconvenience. But six weeks after that, it'll be a nice, smooth road that everybody can just drive through it. Maybe I misspoke. It, it, NDOT's got a project going to Shadeland, Pendleton Pike, and I guess Purple no, Lines. I can talk about that too. But, 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 but that's, the, the, that's the email I got. Okay, this guy, we, we, the planning part didn't come together that we would probably like, but we didn't, we weren't part of it, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Well, I'm just telling you the email I got. So Indar, Indar does have a project next year for Pendleton Pike. They're building, make, making Pendleton Pike more like a, a boulevard with a median in the middle center. So it's uh, it's like state or ran, yeah. So that is an Indar project, and Pendleton Pike is owned by Indar. They're gonna bid that project out next summer. So that is gonna be a that's gonna be a year-long construction on Pendleton Pike. Um, uh, but again, again, there is nothing we can do about stopping that. Or they, they, uh, we had some feedback and they addressed that. But that project, uh, whatever they want to do, it they're going to do it. Yep, we've got a question back here. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, so you mentioned the roundabout on 75th in Oakland, and um, that's great because I'm at that four-way stop every day, and it's just <laughs> it takes forever. So that's great. Uh, is there any plans to do anything on 79th in Oakland in with that three-way stop that's just like, I know that's you guys, the, cut, that's you guys the cut a bunch field, of right? trees, which was really helpful the other day because uh, that stop sign was hidden for a while, but you guys cut the trees to take care of that. That is... A Seventy ninth and Oakland, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we submitted that also along with seventy fifth. Mm -hmm. That didn't qualify for any kind of funding because that, well, how do we do it? Is two ways we can fund it. One is a safety funds. One is a congestion or mitigation. When if there is a backup, mm -hmm. that falls under congestion mitigation. If there is too many crashes, that would fall under uh, uh, that kind of funds. Seventy fifth gotcha. and Oakland and fell because of the delays and people backing up. It fell right. under the congestion criteria. But seventy ninth and Oakland and didn't. Fall under that, so uh, that is why we submitted that when we we submitted two, and that was on the next one. So okay, okay, cool. Thank you. All right, I promise. I was very pleased when I went to uh, Fridays at the Fort that we had new handicapped parking parking lots suggested that people could park in. Are the sidewalks ADA compliant over in that area where a person might cross the street? Which, which area are we talking about? Civic Plaza, no, not Civic Plaza, over by Cultural. Post, I don't know. I mean, like, when, when we... For example, when we do a project and we fix sidewalks, we make sure it's ADA compliant. So for example, when we are doing Franklin Road, every time we replace a ramp and the sidewalk, the slope is going to be ADA compliant, the ramp is going to be ADA compliant. But uh, that doesn't mean that all the sidewalks and the ramps in the city are ADA compliant, right? We are addressing it one at a time. Every time we go into a neighborhood to pave a street, we make sure that all the ramps are met up to standards, any dripping hazards, uh, sidewalks are built to standard. But um, but I, again, I don't know what this area is. We can look at it. Do you know? Yeah, we, we did replace all the ones that are at Otis. Yeah, yeah, it's not, well, now I'm going to actually go from Otis all the way to Lawton Loop West Drive, and I'm going to put ADA ramps in there because that's Fort Harrison. They didn't, they didn't do nothing. We're going to put them in there and replace bad sidewalks in that area, hopefully still this year. So. Good, OK. When it comes to Pendleton the Pike and the and they're going to NDOT's going to bid out a project next year, is there any way for the city to interact with the state and, and ask them about adding like pedestrian walkways that go over or and maybe that's not the best way to do no, it, but some I, other way I, to do that? I, yeah, I know what you're talking. About. So uh, that 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 project is the 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 uh, the reason for the project is safety. 
So it was so basically it's it's because of the crashes they want to do something with people taking it in a certain left turn or crossing the cell. Um, they won't be adding any sidewalks. They won't be putting any pedestrians because that is not the scope of the project. But they did work with us. Our public safety had concerns about you know not having enough place enough places to turn around. They did address a lot of those concerns. But unfortunately, it's not a uh, you know walkability or like that kind of project. So it's not. Um, but I. I think when I mean uh, the trace district where we do from go on the pendulum, the trace district project that we have in the books and it's a big master plan we have uh, that is between Frank uh, 465 and Franklin that w when we ever do that that will add a lot of walkable sidewalks and all that stuff um, for that district and that would let, I mean I don't think it will still have a bridge or anything but it will address um, address a lot of walkable issues on that that stretch. Any other questions? I bet I could guess this one, Kay. <laughs> Is there anything in the budget regarding improving the signage um, before approaching the sunny side curves? There are several accidents that occur in that area. We are continually replacing the guardrails, and I'm not sure this is the appropriate place to ask it, but um, I, the, the two signs that are in place now, I'm not even sure they're working. The flashing lights appear to have been hit or bent by some of the mowing crew that was recently in that area. Well, the mowing crew would be just, my guys, and if they had done it, they would really fixed them. But I just wanted to share one thing before you answer that completely. Um, we meet as a operation working group, and I meet with the team. So we look at those emails that come in. So your email, because it came right after our last meeting, we didn't forget about it, and so Jim can talk a little bit because we actually discussed that Monday at 11 o'clock when we have our um, bi-weekly meeting. Okay, the, the guardrail, the city of Lawrence is not responsible for. That's actually Indianapolis DPW. That is their road to maintain. Now, I know it gets hit a lot, a lot. Just like 71st and Lee Road, we put chevrons up there one day. Come back the next day, four of them are wiped out. We're trying to look into some other alternatives. I don't know if you know where 46 and Sarney is. We spent $9,000 on guardrail to have it wiped out the very next day. I mean, that's just, it's, it's, it's. One of the things that we talked about is the age of the signs, and maybe that's something we can do because it loses some of its reflectability, that kind of stuff, so that when the lights are coming up. So we are certainly looking, we discussed it, and now we're looking at some of those, those options because. So there was a similar issue on Boy Scout Road, if you remember. There's a big curve that around, and the house right there, the, the nice looking house. It used to be, uh, it's still a problem. So at that time, what you know, when the property owner called us, we looked at it. The Chevron signs were all not visible. So we, if you look at it, the, we added brand new Chevron signs, all that stuff. Did that stop them? No. The property owner called me two months ago. Said people are still. So now I told him put a big wall there. You know that is, I mean that is. I mean we can put all the signs and we will look at this in, in this area. I, I do plan to drive this area with Jim and see signage wise what we can do to improve it. Um, but. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like there is all the signs you can put in, right? But ultimately, uh, when a person is on a cell phone or like suddenly see this, and that is exactly what was happening on Boy Scout. Is people were just speeding. That is, I mean, I watched myself there, and as people are not just, they don't care about this uh, curves, and they think they can take it, but they can't, you know. So, but again, we will look at this and see the best we can do to address it. The engineering way to address it is to smoothen the curve and make it like a more smoother curve. That's not going to happen, right? That's a easy. That's not an easy fix. So we're going to drive it, and we'll look at it, and we'll see what we can do. Add a few more signs in a way that they're going to get damaged. Because every time you put a more sign, it gets damaged. We have to go back and fix it, right? Each flasher, flashing sign costs us five to six grand. So, um, so, but we'll, we'll take a look at it. We will we'll see what the best we can do. Um, and it doesn't have to wait until next year. If we can find something now, then we can order some signs and install. We'll install it this year. Four. 
There are so many things, um, and I think that as we listen tonight, you'll see that the three gentlemen who are here, Eric Martin, Shri, and Jim, if you add their years of experience with the city of Lawrence, you are looking at 80 years of experience just with the city of Lawrence. So some of the things that um, come up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when um, some of the things that they come up with are then when we say, uh, many times I'll look at them and I'll share an idea, and they have seen it because of their many years of experience. But they are always still willing to try to do what we can do to make the city a better place. So always share your ideas, send those emails, fill out those forms, because we can't be everywhere as much as we want to be. And you heard some of the constraints when you look and we're mowing 200 and how many acres is it? 240, and we have seven full-time people, and there are a lot of other things that the parks guys are doing. Um, you know, you look in gym, and with the seven street people, um, DPW, you have three people. Three people. Um, so when we look at everything we're doing with the amount of staff we have, we need you. We need each and every one of you to be involved citizens and to help us be the eyes and ears of Lawrence, because that's how together we can continue to make help Lawrence grow and make it and keep it the great city that it is. And it's one of my mottos. I tell people when we start a project, I mean, this is kind of, kind of corny, but you have to make a mess to clean a mess. So when we're doing a big project like we have going on, it's going to be a mess, but it's going to be good in the outcome. So kind of bear with us and. That's all I ask. I see another question here. In regards to street cleaning, is there a system in place that warns uh, the neighborhoods ahead of time that you will be street cleaning so we can get the cars off the street and make it as productive as possible? We've tried to put yard signs, notify people and all that, but you know, when weather comes and we don't get there, and then they call and say, well, you were supposed to be here yesterday. Well, I, I can't, I can't, I'm not, I'm, you know, we get there when we get there, unfortunately. It's like cutting trees. We'll go out and cut, which we're going to start doing a lot of, you know, this fall when the leaves are off, but it, it doesn't work. You know, it just doesn't. I mean, it's just a... One last question. Um... <laughs> is a copy of last year's budget and the master plan available to the public everything is on our website so if you go um the financials are under the controller's office. You'll see the financials there. As far as any master plans, if you go to um, Choose Lawrence, I think all of our master plans are there for parks, bikes, pedestrian, um, and the trades district. So everything that we have, if you can't find it, just give me a call or shoot me an email. I will help you find it on the website, and I will talk you through where to find it so that you can you know, know in case you want to go back and look in the future. We are always happy to share the information that we have. Um, it is there for you to use. Any other questions? OK, one thing Eric said uh, earlier was, oh, do you have something you want to share? No. I was just oh. Oh, okay. Um, we talked a little bit about events. I mentioned the library opening. Um, things really pick up. Do you have a question about that? The other library will close, right? We'll have two libraries and right. Yeah. Yep, that's our understanding. Yep. Yep. And. Yes, and so we had no, we have not gotten any information, so we can't confirm that, but we have not been told that it was. Okay, good. Yep, all right. Thank you. And then, so, events. We have the library I mentioned, and then we really, when September hits, we really start kicking into a lot of stuff. The ninth is the LFD Pickleball Tournament. The next weekend, the 16th, is Barbecue and Blues at, state, at Fort Harrison State Park. 
The 23rd is Loggers and Lawrence over at Fort Bend Cultural Campus. The 30th is Dia Latino de Lawrence over at the Fort Bend Cultural Campus. We also have um, Fridays at the Fort, which is the 25th is our next Fridays at the Fort, the 25th of um, this month. And we will also have the Veterans um, Art Fair going on there that day from 3 to 5 before Fridays at the Fort. Um, now I'm going to jump. I said September. October 7th, we have the Indy Half. So lots is going on in Lawrence. And as Eric mentioned, we are also getting excited for the Eclipse 2024. So what we have going on there is our theme for our parade for a Lawrence Christmas is Ice Eclipse. Then we will have on the 21st, of course, um, I will be our winter solstice event, but that will also have a twist on that. And don't forget that every Saturday and Sunday, starting with a Lawrence Christmas, Christmas, which is on Saturday the 25th, it is Winterfest, and we close on the 23rd of December. Um, then we go into January, February, and March as we prepare for the eclipse to happen here in Lawrence. And Heartland Film will be doing some special programming for us. And then Arts for Lawrence will also have their, right now I believe their visual arts gallery in March up until the event. We'll have some science theme exhibit happening. And then on that Saturday, the 6th, we are looking at um, doing a run. We are looking at a pickleball. Uh, you know, what is it? What we're saying, the um, total eclipse of the sun run, 5K run. So that will happen. And then on the 7th, we're looking at a pickleball tournament. And on the 8th, we have a music festival over in Community Park. Um, and Jay Baker Band will be our headline performance for that. So we have things happening. We're excited about what is happening there. Some of those things with the eclipse are still tentative, and we're waiting for the final approach, uh, uh, final plans and confirmations from some of the vendors who are helping us um, with, those, with that programming. So watch for lots and lots of excitement to happen. And then if you have not shopped at the Fort Bend Farmer's Market, don't forget that that is happening every Thursday evening from 4 to 7 at the Fort Bend Cultural Campus. Um, we have live music. We have exercise sometimes. All kinds of great, over 40 vendors. So you don't want to miss that. And that runs through October 5th. And October 5th is our big fall festival with that event. So I probably missed some stuff there because we have so much going on, but we are here to bring our community together. Pat? Are they going to reschedule Community Safety Day? We are not going to reschedule Community Safety Day because it gets us into October, and those two weekends a lot of families are gone because um, that sandwiches um, um, fall break for the schools. So unfortunately, we will not be able to do that. We are looking at ways that we can engage those vendors who wanted to be part of it. And um, we are checking with the availability of our wing eaters to see if we can get a contest in somewhere. And so, anything else? Yeah, question for you. A lot of dates were given. Where can you go to find out about all these city events if you want to be up to speed? Visit lawrenceindiana.org, click on the event link, and you will find all the information there. Great question. Thank you, Tyler. Yes, we do. We have some of our Fourth Fest postcards left out there, and on the back side, we had all our events. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for caring. And thank you for making Lawrence the great community that it is. Thanks.